prepared the liver, even without the radiologist telling you that this is fatty, you can tell it's fatty. The chance that these adrenal masses are pheo is zero. If you understand how to use imaging phenotype, you don't need to do biochemical testing in these two patients. Those can't be pheochromocytomas. Pheochromocytomas are denser. They don't have a lot of lipid. They're adrenal medullary, so the Hounsman unit's score is higher. So these are two pheochromocytomas. And you can see the density in these masses is very similar to the liver. It's also important to recognize that pheochromocytomas just don't suddenly appear at four and a half centimeters. They grow slowly. We now recognize this because we have over 20 cases of patients that had imaging in the past for other reasons. We see them, you know, in 2010, but they've had images over the past five years. We can go back over those images and determine the growth rate of pheochromocytomas. Typical growth rate is between 0.5 to one centimeter in diameter per year. So this patient's going to develop a pheochromocytoma in this left adrenal gland. Here's an image that's done a year later. You can see it's getting slightly thicker. Three years later, there's a definite mass. And four and a half years later, it's at this point the radiologist recognizes there's an adrenal mass and the patient's referred for endocrine consult. All biochemical testing for pheo is negative but this is a dense mass, it's a vascular mass, it's a pheochromocytoma until proven otherwise. I'll just show you one more case. You actually can see the tiny baby pheochromocytoma. It's that little white dot right there. And we're going to watch that grow up. And it's at the scan in 2002 that the radiologist recognizes there's an adrenal mass referred to endocrinology. All biochemical testing for pheo is negative. This is a pre-biochemical pheochromocytoma. Some more tips. Fractionated plasma metanephrines have a 15% false positive rate. Combine that piece of information with just how rare pheo is, you'll find that 97% of patients with increased plasma nor metanephrine do not have a pheochromocytoma. How many other endocrine tests can you say that about? That 97% of the time when the test is abnormal, the patient doesn't have the disease you're looking for. So that's why if you don't have plasma metanephrines in your country, that's okay. This is not a great test. <laughs> so let me just give you an example. 81-year-old woman, hypertensive, CT for right-sided abdominal pain. She has an enhancing mass in the mid-left kidney consistent with renal cell carcinoma shown here. She also has an incidentally discovered 1.9 centimeter left adrenal mass shown here on axial image and here on coronal image. Hound's mean it score is low. This is a fatty mass. You can tell it's a fatty mass just looking at it. You compare the density to the liver. It's lower. It's darker. Therefore, it's more fatty than the liver. It has fast contrast washout, so it's a benign cortical adenoma. Our urologist that were evaluating this patient, however, said, oh, adrenal mass, let's make sure it's not pheo. So they ordered plasma metanephrines. Plasma metanephrines are easy to do. It's just venipuncture, um, so it's more convenient. But again, it has that high false positive rate. In this case, plasma nor metanephrine, upper level normal 0 0.9. She's 2.23, more than a two-fold elevation. So they referred her to endocrinology for pheochromocytoma. All I did, I did a 24-hour urine. The norepinephrine was normal, metanephrine was normal, catecholamines were normal. I reassured our urologist, this is a benign cortical adenoma. Go ahead and treat that renal cell cancer. Don't worry about that adrenal mass. How can I be so confident about that? These are data we published in 2003 where we plotted plasma norepinephrine on the y-axis versus patient age on the x-axis. Here's the upper limit of normal for norepinephrine. You can see there's a significant positive correlation between plasma norepinephrine and age. And you can see all the false positives. That's that 15% false positive rate. And if you draw a line at age 60, 23% of individuals over age 60 had a false positive plasma norepinephrine. Again, 97% of patients with hypertension seen at a tertiary care clinic that have elevated plasma norepinephrine will not have a pheochromocytoma. The value of plasma metanephrines are when they're normal. If they're normal, 
it's unlikely in your symptomatic patient that they have a FEO. But again, in that pre-biochemical FEO patient with adrenal and stenoloma, even plasma METs will be normal. Most reference labs, <coughs> labs in the United States have standardized their 24-hour urine fractionated metanephrines and catecholamine assays to normal, lab <coughs> normal laboratory volunteers that are drug-free and have normal blood pressure. I've never tested such a patient for FEO. Why would I? So why would we use that as our reference range? So this is different than determining a reference range for creatinine or potassium. We're looking, we should be looking at a reference range based on patients sought to have FEO but don't have FEO. So when you do that, with appropriate cutoffs uh, for this rare tumor, we highlighted in this article in Clinical Endocrinology in 2007. And our cutoffs are 50% to about 100% higher than most reference labs in the United States. And the cutoffs are shown here, metanephrine less than 400 micrograms, normet less than 900 micrograms, total met less than 1,000, norepinephrine less than 170, epinephrine less than 35, dopamine less than 700. I want to make one more comment on biochemical testing. I know several countries uh, in Asia don't have metanephrine yet. And this does put you at a significant disadvantage. There are a remarkable number of patients with FEO that where the catecholamines will be normal, and it's only the fractionated metanephrines that are elevated. So if you don't yet have access to fractionated metanephrines, I think you need to push your colleagues in your clinical lab to develop the assay. So patients with lab values above these cutoffs either have FEO, they're severely ill, like they're in the ICU, or they're taking a drug that's causing false positive testing, like a tricyclic antidepressant. Let's move on to localization. We usually do not proceed to localization studies until biochemical studies have confirmed that our patient has a catecholamine secreting tumor. Computer-assisted imaging of the adrenal glands and abdomen with contrast-enhanced CT is our first choice for localization testing. That's because 85% of these tumors are in the adrenal glands, and about 95% are somewhere between the diaphragm and the pelvis. meta benzyl guanidine and MIBG scintigraphy is indicated if your abdominal imaging is negative. I-123 MIBG is superior to I-131 MIBG because this photon energy allows single photon emission computed tomographic images, and I'll show you an example of that. If we find a typical less than 10 centimeter unilateral adrenal feo on CT or MRI, MIBG scintigraphy is superfluous. And it may even confuse the clinician because the sensitivity of MIBG scintigraphy is about 80%. About 20% of feos and paragangliomas do not do not take up MIBG. Whereas if the adrenal feo is larger, greater than 10 centimeters, so more likely it might be malignant, or if the patient has a paraganglioma, paragangliomas have increased frequency of malignancy, also increased frequency of additional paragangliomas. Those are the patients where we would do an MIBG scan. I'll give you an example. It's a 38-year-old woman, had a past history of abdominal paraganglioma 11 years ago, now has recurrent hypertension and spells, markedly elevated biochemistry. So she has recurrent disease. Right here you can see this is aorta. This is inferior vena cava right here. This is the top of the right kidney. This whole mass is recurrent paraganglioma. It's pretty much at the site of her initial surgery. Here's the coronal image. So we did an MIBG scan in her case. Uh, we did it to confirm that the abnormality seen on CT indeed was paraganglioma and determine if there were any other sites of disease. So this is the AP view with MIBG. You'll see salivary glands. You'll see a heart shadow. You see liver shadow, usually see some large intestine uptake, urinary bladder, but obviously that's an abnormality, and that does correlate with the spot we saw on CT. Here's the posterior anterior view, and what's interesting about this view is it seems to be a split image uptake. So the advantage of I-123 MIBG is that you can use the photon energy for single photon emission commuted tomographic images, and you get this 3D effect, and you realize that these are two separate lesions that we're looking at, and not just one lesion. One is anterior, the other, the smaller one is posterior. 
You can co-register it with a CT scan, so this is the larger image that's anterior, and here's 